Uh, hey everyone, uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, is everyone having a good B-sides this year? Yeah. Hell yeah, awesome, glad to hear it. Uh, so it's actually George's and mine, uh, it's our first talk, so uh, yeah, it's a special moment. And yeah, thanks for being here, it's gonna be fun. So uh, with that out of the way, just some quick intros. Uh, my name's Arav, and like I said, this is George. Um, I've spent about five years in OFSEC, uh, four years in consulting, and then I switched over to the red team here at Costco, uh, which is where I currently work. Uh, yeah, like uh, my, my nerd credentials, <laughs> like uh, I just like any type of world building in science fiction media, big sucker for good wor world building. So if, you know, any nice fonts and stuff, I'm, I'm all about it. So, um, and most importantly for this talk, I am not a DevSecOps person. I am not a DevOps person, so grain of salt with uh, whatever I talk about today. So, George. Yeah, don't believe a word we say, um, <laughs> basically. Uh, my name's George. Uh, I've been in OffSec for about three years. Uh, that's not to say I haven't had a career before that. It just took me about 15 years to get into information security. So I was a, a convert from audit, risk and compliance. Um, and it was a journey. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's definitely, I think, the highlight of my career, uh, working and researching, doing things like this, uh, and being able to actually wake up in the morning and, and really enjoy going to work. So um, I've had various IT roles, been an administrator, dev, uh, risk, obviously, looking at process, looking at all kinds of other aspects of the business. Um, and something about me personally, I love I love cooking. I, I can't say I'm a very good cook, but I definitely, if I like you, I'll probably bring over something that you think is tasty or at least make the best attempt to do so. Um, and then uh, again, caveat, uh, I'm not a DevSec ops person. Uh, this, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of stuff that has been uh, Googled and researched and uh, thank you ChatGPT. Uh, definitely helped facilitate this in like a two month time frame versus uh, a year or so. Um, so yeah. Yeah, big shout out to OpenAI. Um, <laughs> so um, I hear uh, hackers like Jeopardy. So I have a fun little trivia question for you guys next. And it's related to the name. Uh, can, like we work at Costco, so that's your hint. Uh, does anyone want to take a stab at why it's called Buck Fitty? What is the hot dog? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the hot dog and drink combo, a staple of American culture. So uh, yeah, that's kind of where the name comes from. And uh, yeah, like our North Star for developing this was really like one of the quotes by uh, one of our former CEOs, which was, you know, if you raise the price of the hot dogs, I'll fucking kill you. But, and, <laughs> and I hope, uh, is there anyone who works at Azure here? Anyone who works at Microsoft? Anyone? No? Oh, okay, well, this, this quote is for you guys. Like, <laughs> you know, please don't raise the price of the VMs. Like, this whole talk depends on it, so. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get into sort of the overview of uh, Buckfitty. Like, why did we make this tool, right? And uh, just to like sort of uh, set the stage a bit, uh, what do we do as a red team here at Costco, right? Like, we have essentially three primary functions, right? Uh, the first is red team engagements, like spoiler alert, and the second is penetration tests. And the output of both of those types of engagements gets you know, fed into a reporting pipeline and we deliver reports to the teams that we work with, right? So that's kind of like our, our, main, like our main goals uh, as a red team. So when I first joined Costco, and I think George, George has only been there about a year or so more than me, uh, so I started working there about like nine months ago. Uh, one of the big challenges that we had with our current infrastructure setup was that it was static, it was inflexible, and it was opaque, right? So when I say it was static, I mean that the infrastructure stack itself didn't lend itself uh, a lot to experimenting, to iterating, to building like new components and adding them in. Uh, inflexible in the sense that we, did, we couldn't just turn it off between engagements, like it would, it would always stay up. And uh, you know, why would we wanna waste money on infrastructure that's constantly running if we're not using it at the time, right? And opaque, uh, so people come and people go, uh, you know, they switch jobs. So uh, the people who developed the infrastructure ended up leaving uh, Costco. So uh, what we were left with was this sort of really brittle tool that we couldn't really experiment with, but we were <laughs> super scared if it ever went down because, you know, you don't want to break something and not know how to bring it back up without the right documentation. So those were the three problem like sets that we identified and that we sought to address with developing Buckfitty. 
And and I think these, and I think I don't think we're alone in in this kind of issue across the industry, right? Like I think a lot of teams find it difficult, especially in larger, more mature organizations, to to be kind of uh, have a startup mentality and be able to spin up things uh, and have a lot of flexibility and not be part of an oversight board review, something just to have like you know a VM spun up with a, a public interface. So um, definitely applies. It's not just Costco. I just want to say that. Oh, and we don't we're not representing Costco. Like on this, yeah, talk. we just, just work at cost, just for the lawyers. Like, uh, yeah, uh, this is our stuff. Yeah, so yeah, we definitely felt a lot like this. Uh, like every time we looked at our infra, we were just like, how does any of this stuff work? Uh, so uh, we had sort of like the choice between reform or revolution, right? Uh, we could either like paper it over with band aid solutions, like incrementally change things around, try and figure out what was happening, or just reapproach the problem and come up with our own uh, you know, sort of solution that hopefully wouldn't take up too many dev cycles, right? Which is what I'm gonna get into next. So our goals were uh, for it to be cloud-based, uh, easy to understand, uh, modular, and you know, have, it is technical debt, but we wanted it to be worthwhile technical debt. Uh, so drilling into those, uh, cloud-based really works for us because uh, it allows us to be very ephemeral with our stack. We can spin up and spin down as we see fit. And you know, uh, one of the big advantages of using cloud-based compute is that you only pay for the compute that you actually use, right? Like as opposed to on-prem solutions. Uh, and uh, easy to onboard team members onto. Uh, that's so we made this tool very, e very turnkey. So. Any, like, you know, even if George and I were vaporized tomorrow, uh, like other team members on our, uh, like other team members would essentially be able to download the, uh, the code and just hit Terraform apply and like it spins up, right? No arcane knowledge required. Uh, modular, uh, so that we could experiment, like we can plug in, plug out different components, uh, you know, just experiment with different tools, uh, anything that we wanted to uh, try out, like see if it works for us and then like take out if we don't like it or keep it if we do. And uh, we initially, we're not a big team, right? Like we're like around eight people. So technical debt really weighs heavily on us. So we, we didn't want to take on technical debt uh, that wasn't worthwhile, right? So we're not trying to avoid technical debt entirely, but we do want it to be like a tool that's actually needed, that's not just like a hobby project, uh, you know, uh, so it, it has to be worthwhile. Like it has to be worth our effort and our time. So getting into the design philosophy, uh, are there any DevOps people in the room? DevSecOps? Okay, cool. Uh, so this is for you. Uh, <laughs> like, this is like I am like you know I all of my knowledge about Terraform, uh, which I'm going to get into. All of my knowledge about all of this stuff, uh, definitely like. I got it within a two-month uh, time period, so I'm sure we, did, we we made some mistakes as we made this. Yeah, we, uh, we need help. We need <laughs> yeah, help. like so, come talk to us afterwards if you know, if, or you know, shout it out in the question section uh, if you have any doubts or if you see any glaring errors. Um, cool. So, uh, getting into the stack of things, right? Like we're we're this is an Azure tool. Uh, this uh, and the reason it's Azure is just because like you know our company is going to pay for it. Uh, like that's the that's the only reason. Uh, we definitely like I I'm way more familiar with AWS uh, than I am with Azure, but uh, you know it's this is the cost sink that it goes into. So uh, that's the reason why we went with Azure, and we're we're gonna get into this uh, at the conclusion where we talk about some of the improvements we want to make. But we definitely want this tool to be multi-cloud, like cloud agnostic. We don't want to be locked into a specific uh, uh, like cloud provider. So uh, that's definitely on the horizon. Uh, cheap compute. Uh, yeah, we definitely wanted this to be like a uh, bang for your buck. Uh, we we wanted to use the bare minimum amount of compute necessary to actually accomplish our goals. And this is a really great website. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it, but cloudprice.net. Uh, it's kept uh, pretty up to date and it's sortable and you have pricing for Azure, AWS, and GCP. So it's a great resource. It's uh, definitely a resource we leveraged in terms of trying to come up with what kinds of uh, you know virtual machines we wanted to use uh, during, uh, like while we were building this tool. Uh, Terraform was really uh, sort of foundational to this whole project. Uh, it allowed us to think modularly about how we wanted to develop uh, components off the stack. 
And I thought it was a really neat way of approaching the problem where you don't, you're not really stuck with a manual way of doing things. You don't have to go into like the Azure CLI and like, you know, set things up uh, in a manual. I, I mean, you could script it out, but I feel like Terraform handles, you know, the how parts of interacting with Azure. Uh, and we can focus on the what, like, you know, what, what is the end state that we want, right? And that was really valuable to us at the sort of development, devel developmental velocity that we were going at. And uh, yeah, it's easy to iterate upon. Uh, you can just, you know, experiment like that. That's entirely like, that's how Buck Video was built. Like we just kept like experimenting with different, uh, you know, Terraform config files, uh, seeing what worked, what didn't. And yeah, it was really, it was really useful for us to kind of iterate quickly. And I also think it goes to the, uh, the not the tribal knowledge, kind of like alleviating that tribal knowledge issue because oh, yeah. you have infrastructure as code. You don't have a bunch of guessing like, will this run with two CPUs? Will this need like multiple disks? How much RAM? Um, I need to call, you know, the guy that just left for Fiji, quit the company uh, to figure all that out. Um, Terraform provides like a kind of a unified kind of source of truth of what it takes from an infrastructure level to actually build up this this platform and the tools that you know this red team needs to continue operations yeah definitely it was it's super readable and anyone can read terraform code it's uh very easy for humans to parse uh so it's definitely useful for you know uh going back to one of our goals which was we wanted it to be easy for our team members to you know decipher uh so it's it was really handy for that as well. Like anyone can look at Terraform code and like figure out what the gist of it all is. Um, yeah, George, you want to talk about Tailscale? Yeah, so jumping into Tailscale, I know uh, just to give a little bit context, take a back step, um, I know a lot of the, the overview of this talk is very Tailscale centric. Um, and when we got the email that our talk was accepted, um, we were like, oh, oh crap. We have two months. Let's um, let's maybe like do something on top of Tailscale, so we're not just you know talking about like an ivory tower. This is what we could use Tailscale for. We actually developed a platform with Tailscale being the kind of hinge pinch of the networking and tunneling aspect of the C2 infrastructure and the other like operational related services that we've built into kind of like this demo. Uh, and we're going to demo like what you can do actually live with. Uh, an overlay network kind of topology uh, used for tunneling uh, as part of red team operations or pen testing as you compromise assets and pivot within a network and want to like tunnel out or remain silent. Um, that kind of tail scale was the foundation and we're going to build up on top of that in this talk. So, um, so on that note, Tailscale, it's a, it's a great service. Uh, it's an overlay network. Uh, we looked at a few different competitors uh, like Nebula uh, from Slack. Uh, Tailscale seemed a lot more feature rich with specific tools and baked into the client for things like netcatting. Uh, once you've established a connection, uh, file sharing was really straightforward within that wire guard tunnel. It's all very encrypted. Uh, I, I really, from the experience I've had with uh, using Tailscale as a way to access Dropboxes within a network, it, it's, it seemed very, almost too easy to get in and out of, of a, an enterprise environment. Not saying that Costco was that environment, but I would say of the many places I have worked, which were Fortune 50, 500 companies, I think the, the NAT traversal aspect of overlay VPNs that are coming out recently in the last couple of years are really, um, are really, I don't know a lot of ways to avoid that being able to get in and out of almost any network that's routable from the internet that I've seen. So um, I was excited to start deploying it within um, as a as a backbone for other services, and I haven't had any problems as of yet. So, um, yeah, moving on from Tailscale uh, as a VPN service, um, we also wanted to kind of stick with the modular context of our platform because if we did all get vaporized, me and Arav, as the architects, um, we work with very competent people and, and technolo technology savvy um, folks on our team, but they, they are amazing at things like developing malware. Uh, they really want to focus on what they love doing on their team. 
And we love doing architecture and solving problems as well as doing pen tests and other things. But uh, we found a niche that, that really was a support role with building out tools and, and talking to our operators and asking them what, what would make their lives easier and then trying to build that out within Azure or whatever. And, and Docker seems like it was a perfect method of getting an idea from an operator uh, finding a like a proof of concept open source solution to that that someone spun up, uh, making sure that it's secure enough to implement for our operators, so we're not piggybacked on by real malicious actors, uh, and then deploying that quickly without a lot of uh, development overhead, like on the operating system level of a VM. So uh, we could pick and choose from a few competitors for a specific service, throw that into a platform, and have it play nice with other services. Uh, with very little overhead, and that can be easily translatable in the event that somebody does leave the company um, to to someone who's technically savvy, knows what the service is doing, and can kind of like you know Google the rest of the way there to either spin it up, replace it, or you know update it as needed. So um, Docker really helped with this environment, uh, and it also integrates really well with Terraform, and that's pretty much why we chose it. Open source components in general, um, we, we wanted to stay cheap. We did this research on the side. It wasn't sponsored by Costco. Um, so we wanted to stick to the buff 50 rule very closely. Um, we got it down to about 150 a month or so. If like you're live, no, well, not even like, that, 50 it's, bucks? It's like 50 bucks, yeah. Okay, wow, I'm, I'm glad I didn't open up my Azure account. It's, it's all our own. Um, so yeah, about 50 bucks a month to run like a fully functional platform that you can do pen testing off of or red teaming um, with a lot of open source tools. So like zero costs on the open source tooling and amazing community out there for security especially like the the even the like tail scale open source their protocol and within a ma like a year or so uh, there was just really great tools out there that employed that protocol uh, and you could spin up like lookalike copycat tail scale clients and servers uh, so you didn't have to go through tailscale.com you could have as many users as you want. Um, if you had the kind of the motivation to configure it all yourself. So you definitely get into the weeds with open source. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of uh, support in forums and guides and things like that. And sometimes there's not, and there's not at all, or it's completely wrong. And you're like, I, I got to reinvent the wheel here. But um, you know, there, I was surprised I mean, I was really excited to get onto a red team at an enterprise and have like an open checkbook for things like Cobalt Strike and all the tooling that you know I imagined would make life super easy. And, and then when I started doing the research and I got to know those tools and started doing the research with the open source community, I found a lot of comparable things to some of the really advanced tools that we saw um, within the enterprise that had like counterparts that were completely free. and. And really secure. So it was it was a it was a fun two months. I learned a lot, um, and I fully support open source components to cut costs and also stay really safe and secure. So um, yeah. yeah. So back to back to my um, prior comment about like we had uh, we were coming up with all these grand schemes as soon as we got the uh, acceptance email for the talk, and we were like, let's do. Let's do like a cloud agnostic Terraform build that can be like deployed on any cloud service whatsoever that spins up now or like historically and like a bunch of like really cool things and services and and then like after like four weeks of trying to make it all fit together, we're just like, okay, let's get the silver. Um, you know, no fancy stuff. We'll just get the 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 operator tool belt of services so that uh, you know if you get if a red team gets fired or the company closes doors, they can spin up a consulting firm the next day and, and still be you know, pretty dangerous. So uh, that's what we're going to see today. Yeah, and, and this is a pretty ugly architecture diagram. Uh, but essentially, like, it's, like the, broad, the broad strokes of this is uh, you know, our stack is very simple in its current state right now. Uh, it's basically one VNet, one subnet. All of our VMs live inside of it. Uh, there's three different sort of control plane kind of VMs. Um, and then there, we're also spinning up like three uh, pretty much like vanilla Kali Linux VMs that you can like pen test from. Um, so in terms of what's on each VM, George, you want to take? 
Yeah. So breaking it down, just just uh, because we were really using kind of bare bones uh, VMs and trying to trying to keep the operating costs as low as possible, we used the you use some very cheap VMs for things that didn't require a lot of compute. So like a management VM with a uh, tail scale slash head scale as the open source solution for the tail scale protocol, uh, key cloak, uh, and nginx, they all, they're not really memory intensive, uh, compute intensive. So we just put them on a super cheap, uh, VM, uh, and then, uh, moved on to the app server, which had a lot more of the, like operators are going to be actively using this. This, this could have memory spikes. Um, it could suck up a lot of hard drive space resources. Uh, we want this to be super secure. Maybe, you know, if, if this server gets compromised, we don't want it touching like other things. So, uh, you know, we, we stuck with, we had a little bit more money put in to the app VM, uh, still really reasonable. Uh, and then we have the dashboarding tool Homar, um, to make everything kind of pretty and, and very usable for the operators. Uh, uh, Git T as a Git repository. I'm, you know, it was, it was a tough call between GitLab, Git T. Git GitLab's a industry standard. I think it's really good if you're going to get into infosec and especially like uh, security development, malware, and things like that. Um, GitLab, GitLab is a great tool. Um, and uh, but Git T is, is is lightweight. So if you're just kind of do bare bones, um, it's not going to have as much um, like a performance hit to your server. Uh, it's much lighter weight, and it gives you what you need. It's also uh, code repository that that rivals like GitHub in GitLab in the in the uh, in the services that it does provide um, the functionality that it does provide. Uh, so for for on the cheap on your own, uh, Git T is a great option. And then a couple of things like uh, Private Bin and Ghostwriter. Private Bin's great just for sending you know files and texts and things. It's nice to have a paste bin. Uh, server up, but if you're red teaming and you and you could potentially be like especially white hat like red teaming pen testing uh, where you don't want your findings to be publicly disclosed or revealed, uh, we 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 found a solution that in house that uh, so there's the convenience still to the operators, but it's all within the servers and it's all going over a a, a client to client like WireGuard connection. So um, we did throw that in there, and then Ghostwriter. Uh, one of the one of the totally overlooked kind of aspects of working for a company and doing things like audit or pen testing is the reporting aspect of it. Uh, so the communication, the clear and concise communication of what your findings and the impacts of those findings are to uh, an executive or senior management suite of people, um, it needs to it needs to have not only good written like communication, um, it, it, it doesn't have to be written just well, it also has to look good. Uh, and there's actually a dearth of, of report writing tools out there. Like there's very advanced tools that are super clunky um, and super difficult to actually use and just way overdone in a lot of ways. Um, uh, from my audit background, like that, that it was just a pain to work on a lot of tools. Uh, and then there's like the other tools that are more convenient and more intuitive tend to lack a lot of features and especially formatting of the final report uh, with whatever branding and backgrounds and templates you want to use uh, from the marketing team. Uh, but uh, Ghostwriter was very surprised. It's something Arav found. Um, and I wish I had known Arav earlier in my career because like I could have presented this to a lot of other places I worked at and been like, this is, this is using open source kind of scripting like technologies that you can you can copy off of like a lot of forums there's a lot of support for this it's not proprietary kind of file like formats and things like that that it's going to export into um, and it's also incredibly secure like i was really surprised um, I, I just gave up trying to incorporate it uh, as a docker container into our own system i just installed it on the bare metal because even though it was containerized, it was it was kind of all wrapped up into its own like binary, and um, it, it just was really difficult to pull apart. And that's part of its security. So you want something if you're going to store your findings on to not be able to be compromised. You know, even if the servers um, servers broken into and someone's escalated privileges, you you want those findings as secure as possible. And, and Ghostwriter for being I don't know how it's free, honestly. It's uh, 
it's a great tool. I'm probably building up way more than I should, but um, I was really impressed with it. Yeah, shout out to Specter Ops yeah, for developing Specter Ops. and open sourcing it. Um, and then and then kind of wraps up the app thing. So that that's like a tool belt, I think. You got reporting, uh, you have uh, development, uh, repository code repository, uh, and then you have a dashboard. Uh, I think if if you have uh, a team that really is able to to do their own stuff and write their own stuff, and you have developers on that team, uh, and you um, are a capable group of people, that's kind of all you really need to start being dangerous. Um, of course, there's other things uh, that you could have that, that add efficiency or operational convenience, um, but uh, a repo, um, a file transfer system, and a reporting function, um, that's, kind of, that's kind of the crux in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt. I've bled many people astray in my life. Um, and then the last component, this is really for red teaming. This is red team centric. Uh, you have uh, C2 servers uh, that, because it's exposed publicly, kind of wanted to keep it on its own thing versus rolling it into app, because it is going to be talking with beacons and implants that you have on the network. And you don't you kind of want to isolate that from the rest of your operation center. It's kind of like a tiered system. Uh, and you also don't want other things inter intervening. Like the less processes on a C2 server, the more lightweight it is and less things potentially going to mess with uh, some of some of like the, the beacon technologies or the, the, the way things are, are barely held together on some of these you know, uh, tools. Um, especially the open source tools, they're they're great, but you know it could be taken down, you know, with a feather at sometimes. Um, so, so we had Metasploit Handler, which is basically going to receive like Meterpreter shells. So if you want to deploy payloads, the Meterpreter is a great open source tool for developing, uh, just quickly spinning up like a payload for an x86 Windows architecture. Uh, I can use MS Venom, uh, dump out a payload in like a couple seconds. Uh, drop it on uh, a target network and have it start calling back, uh, especially if my target was compromised and I installed Tailscale on it, um, it, it it's going gonna, it's gonna to have no problem busting out of whatever NAT devices, firewalls, um, as, long as, as long as that initial client registration worked, um, you pretty much can have a beacon silently doing whatever its thing is and executing commands like no problem. So. Uh, we chose Sliver, Sli2. It's open source. It's actually a, a shout out to Arav. And oh yeah, his, his I, I used to work for Bishop Fog. I, I used to work for the company. Uh, one of the people at the company developed this. Uh, you could use another C2 for sure. Like uh, I'm just more familiar with Sliver, so we dropped it on here. But you could definitely just swap it out with something that you're more uh, familiar with, like Mythic or Havoc, or what have you. Yeah, yeah. So that rounds out the basic architecture. Yeah. Uh, cool. So in, in terms of like demoing this, uh, so the prereqs that you would want like to run uh, this tool yourself, you would just like clone this, uh, uh, clone the repo. Right now we're still sanitizing some of it. Uh, it's going to be up within the week. Uh, an Azure account, uh, admin privileges on the Azure account, and like $50 or whatever you can scrounge up from your couch. Yeah, good. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh yeah, it's live, but there's only like, I, I think there's only like a readme and like a wiki on there. Yeah, like I, I just got the skeleton out, but we'll be putting the code in there. It was up to the last minute. <laughs> cool, so I think we can play the video. So we're just gonna quickly demo uh, Terraform spin up and tear down. Yeah, uh, just to show you guys like how fast it, it can be, uh, like, or how fast it is, I, I should say, uh, to spin up and spin down. Uh, so. Uh, so on the left, we have our Terraform uh, sort of code base and like the shell. And on the right, we have the Azure account in which uh, we're deploying this into. Uh, so right here, I'm just uh, hitting apply. And um, there's going to be variables that you can um, configure, like the name of the, like the host names and like, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the, what, what do you call it? Like the, the resource group names and stuff. Like you can just customize it however you want. And that's the nice thing about Terraform is that you can essentially feed it in these variables, like whatever you want. That, that's the part that you can edit to suit your purposes, uh, but the core logic stays the same. Uh, so uh, it's super flexible like that. You just pass in your own variable file. So I think around 215. 
Yeah. So it takes about like a couple of minutes to spin up. Uh, so you can see it's just it just finished over there. And uh, once we refresh the Azure portal, you're going to see all of those resources live, and it's ready to go. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to click around, and yeah, there's public IPs and everything. So the whole stack is operational at this moment. It took us about like two minutes and 15 seconds to get it running. And at this point, I'm also going to run the destroy command, which is going to spin everything down. And yeah, you can probably skip that. Yeah, and it's, it's just going to go through uh, the, uh, the resource group, delete everything, and at the end of it, uh, you're going to see me, yeah, like right there, it took like, what, like two minutes. And yeah, like uh, the whole stack is down again, right? So super easy to spin up and spin down, uh, really flexible. Uh, you know, so if you have an engagement, you can start it up at the beginning of the engagement uh, with super little latency. And then at the end of your engagement, you can just tear it down uh, as quickly as you spun it up. Yeah, and, and definitely, definitely, definitely remember to take everything, all your reports off the servers before you do. Like print out the report, get into the executives, and then tear stuff down because you're not gonna get it back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's lost to the ether. Um, cool, so, so yeah, see. now we can uh, show you guys like uh, the live demo. We already spun a stack up, uh, so uh, George is gonna just walk us through like what it, what it looks like under the hood. So I'm just gonna have a moment of silence for the demo gods. No. Okay. No, it hasn't broken yet. <laughs> I just warded it off. Um, so, so this, this, what's going to be on the repo publicly is kind of a sandboxed version. Uh, I, you know, the, it was configured to kind of be self-enclosed. Uh, initially, we didn't even want to open up to the uh, to expose anything to the internet. It's kind of like a uh, an environment that you could play around with in Azure to just get a taste of it and see how you liked it and if you wanted to add stuff to it. And there's gonna be, there's definitely a good amount of configuration you could do to lock it down to get everything self-signed certs enabled to get, um, you know, Let's Encrypt or CA signed certs um, on the, uh, the domain names that you would buy to, to then connect to this platform from external devices or if you want it to be working remotely and attacking like a network. Um, you, you just, you just you, this, there's a lot to be done on top of it. But what we did, uh, we just kind of uh, bogarted the name Buck50 on the Azure domain um, for West US 2. Uh, we uh, tweaked this a little bit so that we could access it externally. So I'm accessing it from a web browser. Um, and the team buck 50 are all kind of DNSA records that are built into the head scale configuration. Uh, and, and you can modify that as you see fit. Uh, but it does take some kind of reversing or at least looking up and Googling, like how to install, you know, head scale server. Um, what do I need to do if I want my own like personal records for devices and call outs? So, um, once you get it to that point, um, make it your own a little bit. Uh, you can be presented with like this dashboard. So I set up three different dashboards. I have a default dashboard for someone who doesn't even have access. This is a public view dashboard for a noob on your team. Um, you can totally mess with them uh, and uh, have them do like a checklist, onboarding checklist. It's just, it's kind of like the gloss of having a dashboard service versus just having a static web page with some buttons for, you know, your other tools. So. Um, we got the orientation page, then we have like an operator page. This has the services, uh, added some bookmarks that are kind of relevant to InfoSec, um, integrated with Slack. Um, this one, you can just like open, opens up the app, Discord, uh, and then you can access like Ghostwriter, Git-T, you know, the Paceman services we talked about. Um, but you can't really administer anything. So I set up a third one where you can actually go in and change the reverse proxy. You have uh, links to the administrative portals for all the services, uh, and you can really start customizing like when you add devices to the network, are they gonna be uh, like special case systems? Are, they, are you gonna add like more infrastructure where you wanna mess with Nginx and, and, and have services route directly to that? Um, uh, and and uh, now we can start getting into kind of the administration part of the thing. So head scale. Um, kudos to Headscale. 
uh, it took, it was definitely a little bit of a learning curve for me. Um, I'm sure not for a lot of people, but um, getting it set up so that it was as tailscale.com um, like intuitive and usable. Uh, it, it took a minute, um, but we got there. Uh, we got a web UI uh, front end install on the, on the head scale command kind of CLI interface. It's an additional service. You don't really need it. If you're comfortable with CLI, you can just SSH into the management server and, and start running uh, tail scale CLI commands on like Docker EXE um, in the container and add devices, register things, create pre-auth keys. Um, some of the, some of the, some of the things I like about this web UI is, is just like, like graphically, like you can, if you had a bunch of, um, if you were trying to like just give a link or, or some screenshots to, to an operator so that they knew, okay, you, your devices are on this subnet, you can route to like the 10.16 and 192 on, on this part of the network. And then like 172 is gonna be another device on another part of the network. You can really quickly reference that with the overview. Um, but essentially, um, head scale and, and tail scale, the client acts as its own DNS server. So um, the GUI client, like uh, I was kind of like, is this too much? Is this gonna be too much overhead? Is this too much fluff for engineers? But um, this, this client really kind of streamlines a lot of the, the command line commands that you would want to use as an operator, in my opinion. like. Uh, accessing exit nodes. So exit nodes is a feature of Tailscale where uh, since, since it's a, a distributed VPN architecture, there's no centralized VPN server that you're connecting to. Every client can itself be a VPN server and every other client, you can have multiple exit nodes enabled uh, and any other client can then use any device that they wish at any time independently of the rest of your team um, to exit node your traffic through that device. So uh, it basically spontaneous, you can like, you can have ephemeral VPN and servers. As soon as you get a, a, a Dropbox or a target compromise and you set up the client on that system, that system can then start accepting traffic from the rest of the team uh, and route it through that, that network and uh, effectively start pivoting and doing whatever you want. And you can dynamically shut that down at any second. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just it's it's just very um, very convenient, and it's all over WireGuard, so it can run silently. Like you really, like there's no there's not going to be any logging of connection attempts to the VPN server like in a traditional VPN. Once once everything's kind of in house on the Tailnet network, connections are only going to be like connection attempts will only going to be visible to the devices that you're either connecting to or from. So um, even other devices, other operator devices, they don't even have visibility into what exit node I'm gonna be using and like why I'm using it, what time of the day I'm using it. Uh, and one of the main motivators for doing the open source head scale build, despite the learning curve, is that every connection attempt, like if, you're, if we were gonna use the enterprise version of tail scale and pay the money, and have as many users as we wanted, um, we're still using their coordination server, uh, which kind of allows the whole NAT traversal aspect and makes it really easy to get in and out of networks. Uh, but Tailscale also is gonna have records of those connections. So what we did is we bit the bullet and, and just kind of built our own coordination server uh, in, in house to tailscale.com completely. Uh, so it's not just, like a money thing, it was like, if you wanna be silent and you want nobody to know and you don't wanna be part of any derp network um, that other people may compromise in the future just because there's not a proof of concept now, it doesn't mean like eventually there's gonna be a big breach. Um, that was a huge motivator for us to get this totally like insourced within Azure and uh, basically run completely silent. It's like Red October basically. Um, so I think I plugged head scale enough and tail scale. Um, moving on to Ghost Rider. Again, a super important, like unsung hero of the whole pen test process, uh, report writing. Uh, you have access to this, uh, this environment. Uh, it, it, you know, it looks kinda, unlike the first time I opened this up, I'm like, oh, 1998, I'm back, like, hi. Um, but uh, 
like looking into it, like the integration with SSO, like the groups you can create through Key Cloak to really pin down um, all the access to the different findings, the different reports. Like it, it uh, I have some familiarity with PlexTrack. It, it, it gave me everything that I could imagine from like most pay for subscription report writing services. Uh, so uh, really happy with that. Again, easy to get to from the console. Like all these are just like those DNS records. Oh yeah, and that, that's a really handy thing about uh, our head scale implementation or a head scale implementation because it has its own internal DNS functionality. You can, you can make these really easy to remember internal sort of URLs. So all of our URLs are just like, you know, team.buckfitty for the dashboard or get.buckfitty or paste.buckfitty. So it made like, it makes the usability off the stack a lot better uh, for the average operator on our team. Yeah, yeah. One of one of the reasons I, I think we might not have our, our code up yet is because I'm going through all the comments that I wrote as I was troubleshooting, like configuring stuff and like trying to like, you know, Easter eggs. Too many Easter eggs. Too many funny jokes. Uh, just need to cut this out and sanitize it. Uh, but long story short, uh, SSO Key Cloak. Uh, if you want to do something like authentic and really cut down, like just your bare minimum, you want authentication services and SSO to these services, which I highly recommend you do, uh, especially in a group environment. It just makes collaboration much easier uh, and spinning up of, of uh, user accounts on those services, kind of seamless. Um, with Keycloak, it was a lot to digest at first, but uh, um, eventually we got there. We, uh, there's a lot of um, capabilities for MFA, especially um, using devices, RSA tokens. Um, but, and also setting up user profiles. So I like being able to have custom attributes where you have SSH keys and can use for later. Um, but yeah, SSO in a nutshell, very important key cloak, um, highly recommend, but good luck finding documentation out there. It's, it's a little bit tough. Uh, and then lastly, uh, not lastly, but we got a couple more services. Um, the GitHub, the GitLab, uh, Git uh, service, uh, Definitely pretty important. Uh, adds wiki, adds more collaboration services for your team. It's also a secure environment to store code uh, without having to get approvals or, um, you know, from from the board of directors or whatever to to have malware in your environment. So, um, pay spin kind of self explanatory, and and that's pretty much it. Cool. Oh. Oh, We do have one last slide to get through. Uh, so just in terms of what's next, what's on the horizon, uh, definitely want to make this multi-cloud. Uh, don't want to get locked into Azure at all. Uh, uh, we also wanted to, well, one, well, and that dovetails very nicely with what we also want to do, which is kind of like a Python wrapper around the whole thing. So it's kind of like a, like a wizard experience almost that you can just like go through and uh, you know, it, like, it'll, dynamically alter the Terraform variables for you, so you don't have to go in and manually futz around with them. Um, and one big one is kind of like parallel stack deployments. Right now we're limited to one per subscription. We definitely want to move to a, uh, to a place where we can have multiple stacks running at the same time, uh, uh, because you know, I'm, I, like our team is pretty small. We, we don't really do multiple red team engagements at a time, but I'm sure other uh, teams do do multiple pen tests or engagements. Um, uh, in parallel, so we definitely want to implement like uh, a parallel sort of uh, deployment model. Uh, also, want to like bake in like known good uh, images and then just deploy them on the VMs. Right now, we run a lot of inline commands on the VMs upon startup, and we want to move away from that. Just clean up the Terraform code base a bit more, so that's like so that you know you can abstract all of that stuff away into the actual image layer of the VM and then you know just use a registry or something to deploy it. Um, also for the Pentest VMs, like the Kali Linux VMs, we want to implement some sort of VNC client um, on their end so that you can just use your browser to access them. Uh, yeah, sort of like if, if you guys have uh, played around with Hack the Box or Offsec, uh, the way they have like uh, browser-based uh, VNC solutions, we want to have that Im implementation as well. And uh, this one is a real like pie in the sky sort of thing, just like a local sort of like uncensored LLM uh, 
a model or containerized model that's running uh, uh, on maybe a GPU cluster or something that'll help you craft uh, exploit code and stuff uh, without having to resort to you know ChatGPT or you know Sonnet, like which have a lot of guardrails around trying to generate malicious code. So we definitely want to explore that, but that's definitely like uh, you know version 3.0 or something, and it's definitely going to be like an optional uh, sort of module uh, in in the future stack. And that's about it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, like I said, it's our first talk, so we're so glad we had this chance to talk to you guys. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, our, our email and Twitter is on there, so uh, feel free to hit us up anytime with any questions or comments about any of the stuff. And like I said, the, the Git repo is also there. And uh, if you want to bookmark it and like, you know, revisit it later in the week, it should have uh, a, work, a turnkey stack for you so that you can just download it and get going with it. Yeah, we, we promise. We <laughs> promise. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we have time for questions, but... Yeah, maybe one or two. Okay, one or two questions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you Sorry, could you repeat that? How many engagements have you run this infrastructure with? How many engagements have we run this infrastructure with? As of now, zero. Uh, we just like sort of operationalized it maybe a week or so ago. So we're looking to get it going. We just demoed it for our team last week. So uh, this should be the model uh, going forward in terms of how we deploy infrastructure for engagements. Uh, you mentioned a lack of documentation on Keycloak, um, and also like like liking open source. I'm just wondering like how you got through that. Like just a lot of googling, trial and error. Like what did you do there? Um, well, I think to answer that, I really have to thank my wife um, for letting me stay up till like 5 a.m. like many nights in a row, just trying to figure stuff out and pushing like the same red button over and over again until something different happened. Um, but yeah, no, it was. It was tough, I think, a lot of the demos that uh, I ran into for setting up things like Git-T and, and the other SSO-enabled things were using Keycloak like 23, 22, uh, and they recently upgraded, like Keycloak upgraded to a V2, which I, I could have gone back to 22, but I, didn't, I did like the additional security of 25, and although it was, it was definitely a steep learning curve and a lot of, I think, just magic, to be honest, um, we got through it. And, uh, um, but yeah, it was, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that trial on a lot of people, I think. If you're familiar with DevOps and, and Keycloak specifically, SNO, I think it's, it's not going to be that big of an issue. But some of the upgrades were difficult to find, and there was one or two, like, command line arguments that I needed to run within the Docker that just made things work finally that I would have never found out unless I was just on the forums until 3 a.m. Hey folks, congratulations on the great talk, first talk, and I admire and commend your bravery on learning something and within two months just putting out a talk together to share it with the rest of the community. Thank you. I am also very excited about the fact that your folks are talking about uh, red team infrastructure, C2 infrastructure and whatnot. That's a topic that uh, I am in charge of within my team and I have another teammate and you, and you kind of reminded me of that as well. So I feel identified with some of the pains that you're talking about, especially with you know running the same deployment over and over and over, trying to figure out what's going on, especially when you don't come from a background of building things. Now, I have a question. When I saw the um, Nginx uh, proxy manager, are you guys using that as well for C2 redirectors? Um. I think that's fun. I think uh, right now it's, it's just for the platform services, but if, uh, if there's a need to not route through TailScale, I think TailScale, a lot of the configuration uh, can be done like within the TailScale, like HeadScale config. Um, and then we do have forwarders. Oh, we forgot to talk about the, the forwarders. So we, we had a, f a few forwarders set up that you can have like regionally diverse uh, servers accepting connections. Um, right now, it's just kind of going over the raw on this platform, but um, if there's a need to not just use like a SOCAT forwarder um, to send like interpreter sessions back to the C2 or beacon information back to the C2, um, then we could probably spin up another Nginx or, you know, Caddy, probably like a Caddy, something lightweight on um, one of the, the forwarding servers themselves and just make it. I mean, that I feel like that's that's something we would run into if we were doing multiple operations at the same time um, with a larger team. 
so it's on the horizon, and I think that's probably something we'll have to tackle eventually. Fair enough. Uh, I'm al I was also very excited to see that you guys implemented Headscale uh, and not Nebula, because that was a different pain that I looked through, and I'm like, we don't have appetite to take this level of complexity, especially in a small team. Uh, a way that I got around the problem of sending uh, data to the hosted control plane in Tailscale was just uh, SSH tunnels, reverse SSH tunnels, essentially, right, between the different infrastructure components. So that way, you know, if you don't have the appetite or the time to set up all the open source side of Headscale, though it looks like an interesting tool. And the last couple of questions before I send, send it off is, uh, I saw a dashboard that had some of the, the DNS names for the different assets that you had, right? Does that dashboard dynamically update as those resources change, or is it is it manual? Um, I think it's manual. It's it's manual. You, they, Homar has the ability to do iframe. Like you can create like an iframe widget, mm. so you could you could link that, and that's that's kind of like our theory on the whole guacamole kind of no VNC uh, web shell mm -hmm. aspect is to put it in an iframe, so it dynamically updates based on um, what you would see if you went to that link or service itself, and you could just like point it to a wiki right in an iframe and, and put it on there, and that's dynamically updated, you know, in real time as the wiki updates. So uh, there's a lot of potential. Like this is just this is just like going to Home Depot and getting like the tool belt with like a hammer and screwdriver right, kind right. of thing. But like, um, I was very surprised with Homar. Like, props to Homar. It's from kind of like the Plex community, um, and uh, I was I was happily surprised how easy it was to kind of like corrupt it even more uh, into like a, a kind of hacking tool um, with things like iframe widgets and things like that. So, well, fair enough, and congratulations again for your talk. Just want to get his question, and this is the last one. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello, my my question is about: Is your Azure sub completely separate from your rest of your org su um, subs, or like, do you access it from your day-to-day -day laptop, or a completely separate? Um, and then, how is like, if it's not completely separate, was there challenges with like risking compliance, that sort of stuff, getting? Getting your getting your Azure sub to do all the bad stuff that they don't normally want you to do in, in a cloud environment like that. Uh, yeah. So our Azure sub is like we're it's kind of unique for us just because we're the red team. So we got to cut through a lot of the red tape that normally exists with Azure subs uh, at Costco. Uh, so we were able to. I, I think uh, like currently we are kind of like just we have admin rights like which you, they normally don't give to everyone, right? Uh, or anyone on like different teams. Uh, so we do have like an isolated Azure subscription uh, that we can spin up uh, resources in that, you know, uh, you know, it's its own cost center. Uh, but yeah, it's not like linked to the broader like Azure infrastructure at the company. Yeah, it's it's kind of isolated. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, typically, they typically do, and in our case, I think they made an exception uh, to allow us to, because otherwise they would just keep getting, and this was the case, like they kept getting uh, pings from their uh, monitoring software saying like, hey, like there's malicious code here, there's da da da. So uh, they basically whitelisted us uh, uh, from like the usual um, controls that they apply on everyone else. Okay. Um, if there's more questions, if you guys don't mind taking them outside so we can yep. get prepared for the next speaker. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.